Okay, let's unpack this. Picture this. You're harnessed up high on a platform, maybe looking out over like a forest canopy. Yeah. Then you step off and whoosh, you're flying. Wind in your face, everything rushing past, that amazing thrill of zip lining. It's just pure fun. It absolutely is. But uh, behind that feeling, there's some serious engineering. And unfortunately, you know, as zip lining has just exploded in popularity. Right. It's everywhere now. Exactly. And with that growth, we've seen, uh, well, a pretty concerning rise in injuries. And that's really what we're digging into today. We've got uh, quite a stack of sources here. Everything from heart accident data, ER visit numbers, huh. to the actual industry standards the rule books operators are supposed yeah. to use. And also a really um, pointed critique from an expert about maybe where those rules are falling short. Yeah. So our mission for you in this deep dive is to sort of cut through all that, pull out the key insights. We want to understand the data on accidents, really look at breaking safety and the standards and see how maybe a more data-driven approach could make things safer, especially now with talk about wanting faster rides. It's kind of a look behind the curtain of adventure tourism safety, isn't it? Yeah. And this is where it gets interesting right away. Let's start big picture. The numbers. What do they okay. tell us about, you know, how often things actually go wrong? Well, we can look back a bit first. There's the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, NEISS. They track ER visits. Right. Between 97 and 2012, they estimated almost 17,000 ER visits in the U.S. just from zip lining. 17,000. Wow. Over that period. Yeah, that averages out to like over a thousand visits every single year. A thousand trips to the hospital annually for mm -hmm. over a decade. Mm. What kinds of injuries were landing people there? Uh, the most common things in that NESS data, sprains were a big one, about 40%, then fractures around 30%, and head trauma was uh, roughly 10%. And that time frame, 97 to 2012, that's exactly when zip landing just took off, right? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. There's an article in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine, AJM, that really highlights this. It showed the number of commercial zip lines just in the U.S. went from maybe 10 in 2001. Just 10 to over 200 by 2012. And that's not even counting, you know, the thousands more at camps, parks, backyards. Okay, so way more places to ride, way more people riding. You'd think maybe the injury rate per person would go down as the industry got more experience. Or did it go up? That's uh, that's a really crucial point the AJM article makes. They looked at the annual injury rate per million participants. Okay, per ride. Base. Exactly. And they found it actually went up significantly by over 50%. It rose from about 7.6 injuries per million in 2009 to nearly 12 per million in 2012. Whoa, wait. So the risk per ride was increasing during that boom? That yeah. seems backwards. It does. Yeah. You'd hope for the opposite. Oh. Now, do we have more recent numbers? Yeah, that's the next question. What's happened since 2012? We do have some uh, from Granite Insurance. They focus on the amusement industry. They track rates per 100,000 participants, slightly different scale. Okay. They saw 6.5 injuries per 100,000 back in 2016, and that number seemed to drop down to 4.23 in 2022 based on initial reports. Okay, 6.5 down to 4.23. That sounds like improvement since 2016, at least initially. But you mentioned something kind of alarming about their predictions. Yes, this is where it gets um, really eye-opening from the sources. Planet is actually predicting a pretty significant jump. They're forecasting 15 per 100,000 for 2023 claims. 15, up from that four point something. And you get this, they also project that the final 2022 numbers, once all the claims with longer statutes of limitation come in, say by 2026, they predict those will also rise to that 15 per 100,000 level. Hold on, so the 4.23 for 2022 is just like the early picture and it's okay. expected to more than triple to 15? That's what the source suggests, yeah. Accounting for that claims leg and uh, a rate of 15 per 100,000. Well, the source describes that as potentially making zip lining one of the most dangerous attractions in ride amusements. 15 per 100,000, that's a huge projected jump compared to the earlier numbers. What's actually causing most of these injuries? What's the main culprit according to the data? The sources are really, really clear on this one. Braking. Issues related to braking dominate everything else. They account for something like 60% of all zipline injuries. 60% just from braking. Yeah. That single statistic tells you exactly where the biggest safety challenge is. Okay. So the data shows significant, maybe even increasing injury rates. And braking is the number one problem. How does the industry try to handle braking right now? What are the standards and the tech? Right. So you have organizations like ACCT, the Association for Challenge Course Technology, and also PRCA, the Professional Ropes Course Association. They develop these voluntary industry standards. Covering design, inspections, how to operate them, training. Yeah. 
all that stuff. Exactly. Standards like uh, in SEACCT 03 to 016, they lay out the best practices. And are these standards widely adopted? Does everyone follow them? Well, one challenge the sources point out is that even though installations have just soared, membership in these standards bodies hasn't really kept pace. Ah, so some operators might not even know the latest standards. It raises that concern, yeah, that maybe some injuries happen because of a lack of knowledge or adherence to these protocols. Okay, so what do the standards actually say about breaking specifically? Well, there's an ASTM standard, F295919 from 2019. It talks about friction breaks, spring breaks, those types of systems. Uh -huh. But crucially, the ACCT standards going back to the 8th edition in 2012 and referenced since then, they require an emergency brake system. An e-brake. Right. An e-brake is needed if the participant's arrival speed at the end at the landing platform is expected to be over 6 miles per hour, 6 mph. 6 miles per hour. That sounds pretty slow, actually, like a jogging pace. It is pretty slow, yeah. yeah. The idea is that below that speed, maybe simpler braking methods or even self-braking could work, but above it, you need something more robust as a backup. And does this approach work? Are there examples where good tech makes a difference? There are. Park City Mountain Resort gets mentioned. They apparently have an accident-free record going back to 2002. Since 2002. Wow. And they achieved that, at least in part, to using advanced friction and spring braking solutions. So good technology can definitely help. That's good to hear. It shows it's possible. But despite the standards, despite examples like Park City, the data still shows all these braking injuries and that potential scary jump in the rate. So what's going wrong? This brings us to that critical analysis you mentioned. Exactly. This critique from Michael Troy Richardson, who has a lot of experience in safety and standards work, argues that while the standards exist and are well-meaning, they have some really fundamental flaws, and that helps explain why breaking injuries keep happening. And he specifically targets that 6 MPH rule, doesn't he? Calls it a social construct. What does that mean? He argues it's not really based on deep scientific testing of, you know, the actual physics of a zipline ride under all the conditions you might encounter in the real world. So it wasn't derived from lots of testing. The argument is that it was more like a human-made decision, a line drawn in the sand to simplify things, but without enough hard data to prove it's truly safe across the board. He says it kind of creates a false sense of security. Okay, so if it's not fully grounded in the physics, what specific factors does he say that 6MPH standard misses? Several really critical ones, uh, environmental dynamics for one. He points out that zipline cables expand and contract quite a bit with temperature changes. Oh, right. Metal expands when hot, contracts when cold. Exactly. And that change in cable length and sag dramatically changes the rider's speed. A system designed for 6 MPH on a warm day might see much higher speeds on a cold, taut cable. That makes sense. What else is missed? Participant mass. Simple physics, right? A heavier person builds up way more kinetic energy than a lighter person at the same speed. More momentum. Harder to stop. Precisely. They'll arrive faster and need the brake to absorb a lot more energy. The critique says current standards don't adequately handle the full range of possible rider weights. And what about, like, the weather? Wind? Absolutely. Wind is huge. Humidity. Even altitude. They all change air resistance and speed. Imagine a strong tailwind pushing a rider. Yeah, you could come in way faster than expected. Exactly. So the critique says, if your standard ignores these dynamic factors, temperature, weight, wind your braking system, designed just for that static 6 MPH threshold, could easily fail under extreme conditions. Like the perfect storm scenario. Yeah. Heaviest rider, coldest day, strongest tailwind. When all those variables stack up against the system, yeah. That's when things can go wrong if the design isn't robust enough. That really does sound like a potential design flaw in the standard itself. That's the argument. And the critique highlights another big issue, relying on a human to manually reset an emergency brake after it's been used. Why is having a person reset it inherently flawed? Seems like standard procedure for some things. Well, it goes against basic principles of system reliability and uh, even physics, specifically entropy, the natural tendency for things to become disordered. Entropy. Okay, yeah. explain that simply. Basically, introducing a human operator into a critical safety step, like resetting an e-brake, adds uncertainty. People get tired, stressed, distracted. Components wear out faster with manual handling. It just makes the whole system less predictable, less reliable compared to something automated. It violates engineering principles of robustness. So human intervention adds risk, 
where you absolutely need certainty. He uses a really powerful analogy for this, right? About roller coasters. Yes, and it really makes the point starkly. Roller coasters use highly automated, fail-safe braking systems. Right, you never see someone running out to reset the brakes between coaster trains. You'd never do that. The risk of human error causing a disaster would be totally unacceptable. That level of safety has to be engineered into the system from the start. And the idea of just telling riders, hey, brace yourself or duck if you come in too fast. That's where the critique gets really sharp. It calls that approach absurd and unethical, expecting the participant, the customer, to compensate for shortcomings in the safety design. Like the source's image of ducking chainsaws. Yeah, it's a graphic way to put it, but the point is, safety must be built into the system. You can't just offload the responsibility onto the untrained rider. And related to the system, what about the actual trolleys the police people ride on? Good point. The critique notes that those common two-wheeled trolleys, they're everywhere. They have no brakes on them. Oh, they just roll freely. Yeah. They rely completely on the braking system at the end of the zip line. So if that system at the end isn't designed robustly enough, maybe because it's based on that flawed 6 MPH idea, or it relies on a manual reset that could fail, the rider has no way to stop themselves. So who should be designing this stuff to be safer? Who's ultimately responsible? The critique argues very strongly that engineers need to lead this. Engineers operate under professional codes of ethics, like the NSPE code. National Society of Professional Engineers. Right. And that code mandates prioritizing public safety above everything else. Their whole training is about predictability, consistency, using data, identifying risks, building in redundancy, and fail-safes. Because if the design is weak, if it relies on manual fixes. You get exactly what the data seems to show. Accidents, injuries, lawsuits, and damage to the whole industry's reputation. A properly engineered system anticipates all those variables, temp, weight, wind, and mitigates the risks systematically. Not just hoping the operator remembers the reset or the rider can react fast enough. This definitely sounds like a call for a much more rigorous data-based approach, which leads us straight to this idea of Data-driven decision-making, DDDM, that comes up a lot in the sources. How can DDDM help fix zipline safety? Yeah, DDDM is basically a cycle. You collect data, you analyze it really well to find the root causes of problems, you implement changes based on what you found, and then crucially, you keep collecting data to see if your changes actually worked. It's a continuous improvement loop. Okay, so applying that to zip lines means not just having standards on paper, but actively using data to see what's really happening. Exactly. Take all that injury data we talked about earlier and really put it to work. How specific? Well, DDDM could help pinpoint the exact reasons for braking failures. Was it excessive speed? Was it the rider's weight? Was it the temperature that day? Was a component faulty? Was it human error in resetting the brake? Okay, getting really specific on the why. Right. And once you know the why, that insight can directly guide equipment upgrades. Maybe you find one type of brake fails more often in cold weather. Okay, time to replace it or redesign it. It can also improve training for both staff and participants if you see patterns in how people interact with the system. What are some specific DDDM strategies the sources suggest trying? A really big one is creating a comprehensive national incident database. Imagine combining NIS data, insurance claims data, maybe even anonymized reports from operators themselves. So everyone shares data. Ideally, yes. That would give a much clearer, near real-time picture of where and why injuries are happening nationwide. It would help overcome the current problem where data is scattered or incomplete. More data, better insights, makes sense. What about DDDM for the actual brake hardware? The sources talk about developing truly tamper-proof brakes. Ideally, automated systems, like maybe auto-resetting spring arrays that don't need manual intervention. DDDM could use data from daily inspections, maintenance logs, maybe track brake compression force over time to spot potential issues before an accident happens. Like predictive maintenance, using data. Exactly. And using data for training, too, you mentioned. Yeah, how would that work? Well, if incident data shows, say, that writers of a certain age group often try to grab the cable or they misunderstand instructions under windy conditions, mm -hmm. then analytics on that data can help operators tailor their safety briefings, address those specific risks more directly and effectively. And using data to look ahead, like figuring out the risk of these faster rides everyone wants. That's a key application, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can use historical data, combine it with physics models, and simulate the accident risks associated with higher speeds before you actually implement them. So you can model, like, what happens if you increase speed by 10 mph under X conditions? Right. 
It can show how factors like wind or weight become even more critical as velocity increases. That helps engineers figure out what safety margins are truly needed. And things like real-time IoT monitoring sensors on the system, feeding data constantly, like Park City apparently uses, that gives you continuous data for optimization and immediate alerts if something's wrong. This all sounds way more sophisticated, much more proactive than just sticking to a maybe outdated static rule like 6 MPH. Mm -hmm. But what's the actual regulatory situation? Is any of this required? That's uh, that's definitely a challenge. The sources point out there isn't uniform federal regulation covering zip lines in all states. It's often patchy. So it varies state by state. Yeah. And in many cases, safety inspections are driven more by insurance company requirements than by mandatory government rules. That can lead to inconsistencies. But even if there aren't strict government mandates everywhere, those industry standards from ACCT and ASTM, they still matter legally, don't they? Oh, absolutely. When standards like that exist, courts often look to them to define the expected standard of care for the industry. Meaning what a reasonably careful operator should be doing. Exactly. So if an operator doesn't meet those standards and someone gets hurt, the injured person's lawyer will definitely use that failure as evidence of negligence. And there was an interesting point about OSHA standards, too. Usually those are for employee safety. Yes. This is a really significant legal point highlighted in the sources. OSHA rules, federal or state, are definitely about protecting employees. They'd apply if a worker got hurt, like in that fatal accident in Utah that was mentioned. Right. But, and this is important, the sources cite recent court decisions where judges have allowed OSHA regulations to be used to help establish a standard of care for negligence, even when the injured person was a participant, not an employee. Really? So failing to meet an OSHA rule could be used against an operator, even if the injured person wasn't on their payroll? That seems to be the trend, yes. It expands the potential legal relevance of those safety rules. And this is where experts, like Richardson, whose critique we discussed, become so important in lawsuits. They identify the relevant standards industry, OSHA, whatever applies, and give an opinion on whether the operator met them or not. Okay, so putting it all together, looking ahead, what are the main challenges and the bottom line here? Well, data limitations are still a big hurdle. Getting comprehensive data is tough. You've got legal statutes of limitation affecting reporting. Companies might see data as proprietary. There's no mandatory federal reporting system. So building that national database you mentioned is easier said than done. Definitely. Which makes applying DDDM fully across the industry more difficult. And this difficulty comes just as the industry is eyeing faster rides. Exactly. That's the critical context. Higher speeds mean much more kinetic energy, much less time to react, much smaller margins for error. All those breaking risks we've talked about. They get amplified massively as speeds go up. So the conclusion from the sources seems pretty unavoidable then. It really does. Data-driven decision-making isn't just a nice-to-have, it's essential. It's critical for actually improving safety and, frankly, reducing liability for operators, especially if speeds are going to increase. And on the tech side. The engineering takeaway is crystal clear. Safety needs to be designed in. That means automated, genuinely fail-safe braking systems that are engineered to handle all the real-world dynamic variables, temperature, weight, wind. Not systems that rely on simplified speed limits or, crucially, on humans performing critical resets perfectly every time. So what does all of this mean for you, listening? Yeah. It really drives home that safety in these kinds of thrilling activities like zip lining. It's not just about following a few simple rules or just hoping everything goes okay. No, it's, a, it's really a complex puzzle. It involves physics, understanding the environment, human factors, analyzing data rigorously, and some pretty sophisticated engineering design. It really highlights how vital it is for safety to be baked into the system itself, not treated as an add-on or relying on people to somehow make up for design weaknesses. And as adventure tourism keeps pushing boundaries higher, faster, more extreme, how does the industry make sure that the innovation and thrills is always, always matched, or maybe even led by innovation and safety engineering? Yeah, and thinking about all this data, the stuff we have, the stuff we wish we had. If you were about to step onto that zipline platform, what specific data points would you want to see readily available, reported regularly, to make you feel genuinely confident that it's safe? That's something to think about. 